radical. Fundamental principles of freedom, rational self-interest, and individual rights. This is the Yaron Brook Show. All right, everybody, welcome to Yaron Brook Show on this, uh, what is it? It's Friday, September 13th. I hope everybody's having a uh, fantastic week and uh, ready for the weekend. I certainly am. Uh, well, I've got a busy weekend. Uh, tomorrow, we have to pack up, pack up our, con- our apartment here. And um, then Sunday, we fly to Israel. So that, that, that's what I have to look forward to. On the weekend, Israel should be interesting. Let's put it that way. It should be interesting in the, in the midst of war to arrive there. Uh, will be interesting. I'm um, looking forward to it. Haven't been in Israel for about 18 months or so. Uh, so it'll be good to be back. And um, a lot has happened. A lot has happened since uh, we were asked there. Certainly I haven't been to Israel since October 7th. So very interested in um, the impact. And also just it's, it'll be good to be there just to show support. Uh, all right, what do we want to talk about? Well, you know, we've talked about pretty much uh, you know, the main item in the news over the last two days have been ones that, that I, I've already talked about. So it's, it's, it's how to resurrect them. We, we've talked about pets and eating pets. That seems to be everywhere. It, it, it's, it has not, uh, this still is uh, the leading uh, news item in the news. Uh, and on Twitter, everybody's talking about eating pets. Uh, the memes of uh, the, the, the little songs, videos of... Uh, Donald Trump singing along to eating pets and cats and dogs and whatever, the various memes that have come out of it, brilliant, and uh, they will last uh, way beyond this election. So uh, uh, good for the the creative spirits of uh, uh, so many people out there that that have uh, come up with all kind of uh, memorable ways to remember this debate. Uh, The the latest is that... uh, kind of sad, but uh, the latest out of the pets thing, Haitians eating pets, uh, is uh, that Springfield, Ohio schools have been getting threats, uh, threats, uh, uh, you know, targeted at Haitians, targeted at the Haitian population, maybe kids at the schools. A number of schools had it closed down today and yesterday because of these threats and and not not even open uh, because... um, I don't know what they're, because of crazy people making threats, crazy people, right-wing nutcases, MAGA nutcases, who are making threats against schools related to this uh, this uh, uh, Haitian stuff. I did read some uh, immigration stats uh, that are kind of interesting about Haitians. Um, you know, Haiti is an awful place. It is a poor place. It is a violent place. It is a place in it, the seemingly in constant anarchy. Um, anybody who can escape Haiti and, and come to a sane place like the United States, or for that matter, anywhere in the world, almost, uh, should do so. And, and we should encourage it and, uh, and I think, support those people. But uh, I, I think it is interesting. Haitians that do come to America uh, tend to have a low educational uh, level than, um, than Americans do. So uh, Haitians who come here tend to be poor and uneducated. Their children have higher educational attainment than Americans, than native-born Americans. So uh, Haitian children, the children of Haitian legal immigrants, tend to, be, tend to strive and achieve more in education compared to, um, uh, to American-born kids. Uh, crime rates, uh, Haitians have significant, again, the stats are for legal uh, immigrants, and most of these are legal immigrants, all the ones in Springfield, Ohio are legal immigrants or, or seeking asylum, and if they don't get asylum, they'll potentially be deported. Uh, uh, crime rates among legal Haitian immigrants in the United States, including the ones in Springfield, are lower than uh, legal immigrants from other countries. Generally, they're on the low side, they're below average. And they're significantly lower than crime rates among Americans. Uh, As I've told you before, people in Springfield, Ohio, 
business owners are very happy to employ Haitians. They seem to be hard workers and seem to be highly motivated and very, uh, very um, thankful for having escaped a real hellhole, which is Haiti, and, and now being able to live in the United States. So, um, I mean, you could, uh, you could pretty much figure out for yourselves, I think, what motivates much of the hatred of Haitians. Maybe it has something to do with the color of their skin. I'm not saying it does. Who knows? But maybe it does. Um, and, and the fact that they're the other, and the fact that they're foreigners, and the fact that they're different, uh, and the fact that they come from a hellhole. But the reality is that coming from a hellhole is not guaranteed that you are a hellish person. Indeed, maybe it's time, I don't know, maybe it's time we return to evaluating people, judging people, by their own individual character rather than by the color of their skin, their country of origin and what their countrymen do. Maybe what we should judge is who are you as an individual? And, and certainly they're bad individuals and they're good individuals and uh, we, should, uh, we should want good individuals. And, you know, one way to do that is, is uh, to allow them to work and not to give them any... Uh, welfare. That's one way to kind of screen people for better people, for good people, for morally good people. Put aside everything else. Because that's what matters. What matters is they're morally good people. Everything else takes care of itself uh, in, terms of, uh, uh, in terms of the economics of it. Uh, if, uh, you know, if we require them to work, not just allow them to work, <laughs> how about we actually require them to work? Wow, what a difference that would make. Uh, anyway, so the Haiti story is out there. It's, it's, the, the Haitians eating dogs is a big story. We talked about yesterday. We talked about the day before. It seems like the Iran book show seems to be regularly kind of a day ahead of the headlines. Um, then maybe because I do it in the evening and the headlines come out in the morning. I don't know, maybe. And then the other big story, certainly on Twitter and all over the place, is Luma, is Laura Luma uh, being by Trump's side constantly. There are kind of suggestive videos are put out there on Twitter. I'm not suggesting anything, but there are suggestive videos. Uh, the absence of Melania is, uh, you know, some would say interesting. She, she didn't come to the debate. She hasn't been by side. She wasn't, even though she was in New York, she didn't come to the 9-11 memorial. Lola Luma did, a conspiracy theorist who believe 9-11 was an inside job. She went to the 9-11 memorial. Kind of an insult, an insult to the victims of 9-11 and their families. But anyway, uh, a lot of talk about Lava Luma and uh, a lot of talk about the feud between her and Marjorie Taylor Greene, two of the wackiest people in America today. Um, but really, this brings up this, this bigger issue, and that is... Um, <laughs> has anyone heard of the... Kamala debate earpiece situation. Yes, it turns out the earrings from uh, Tiffany's that have Microsoft uh, microphones that allow her to communicate with aliens, but not with mortals, not with any human technology known to man. So uh, the earrings do not allow for communication with anybody other than aliens. So it's very worrisome that we have a presidential candidate wearing earrings to debate that way she can communicate with aliens. Maybe this is a consequence of the fact that I've been watching uh, the third body problem. Um, anyway, all of this brings up, I mean, the whole earring thing. I mean, the fact that that was pointed out, the fact that an issue was made of that, 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 that these look... I mean, Tiffany earrings. Tiffany. They, they were in Tiffany. Um, it brings up just a stunning fact, and it's 2024, so I don't know why we should still be stunned and... and we obviously not. Everybody's accepted it. Um, Donald Trump is a presidential candidate of the Republican Party. It, it just never ceases to amaze me that this nutcase, uh, who really is a, 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 a ignorant, moronic flake, who's a bit of a nut, and has surrounded himself with nuts, actually has a, a really, 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 really good chance of being the next president of the United States. Again, 
Wasn't enough once. And now the problem is now he's four years old then. By the time he'll be finished, he'll be eight years old then. People, as they get older, they become a little nuttier. Whatever tendency they had during their life becomes, I think, exaggerated when they get much older. So we're going to have a conspiracy theory, crazy nutcase, um, of a president. And, and it really looks like he's got a really good chance of winning. He won. I mean, clearly, Kamala won the debate. Every poll shows that. Uh, I mean, she won it by a big margin, if you believe the polls, um, by anywhere between 25 to 55 percent. People thought that Kamala won the debate. And yet, we'll see how the polls pan out, but early polls at least suggest that it didn't change anything. People say, yes, you won the debate. Yep, Trump was terrible in the debate. Yep, I'm voting for Trump. Um, it, it really looks like this election is basically, at this point, 50-50. Maybe she'll get a little bump, but it's basically 50-50. And the reality is that for some bizarre reason, on every important issue to most people, uh, the economy, immigration, national defense, foreign policy, Trump leads Harris in terms of people's trust in him. Now, part of that is because they're ignorant of economics, ignorant of foreign policy, ignorant of national defense and really, really ignorant about immigration and crime. And he's convinced them that we're in a state of crisis. He, he's way ahead of her on crime, even though, as I said, crime is way down during Biden's presidency. And the only issue Harris leads on are abortion and environment. Abortion, good, environment sucks. That she leads on. So it's um, white people form these perceptions. I mean, it's pretty clear. Kamala's part of the Biden administration. Um, Biden was president when we had 9.1% inflation. Yeah, it's come down, but goods are 20% more expensive now than they were before he took office. You know, income, real disposable income in real terms is flat to down. It's down over the last four years. So economically, people are, you know, they're not struggling, but they feel like they've taken a step backwards. And the reality is, even though I say over and over and over again, presidents shouldn't be, um, shouldn't be blamed for all the bad stuff that happens. And they shouldn't be, uh, uh, you know, congratulated for all the good stuff. Presidents have very little to do with what happens economically. Uh, in this case, you can blame Biden for the inflation, certainly, although Trump had something to do with it because his uh, stimulus package in 2020 certainly uh, exacerbated inflation. And certainly his spending spree actually has down significantly since people don't remember, can't hold that it's down. All they remember is the panic of 2021. The fact that it started in 2020. So yeah, so, so Kamala just can't shake the fact that he's, she's part of the Biden administration and people view it negatively. Oh, there we go. We're frozen again. God. Um, Uh-oh. Uh-oh. All right. Let me, let me uh, implement my backup plan here. Intermittent freezing. We don't want intermittent freezing. Uh, now, while I do this, we might drop. I will be right back, I promise. Uh, so bear with me while I try to pull this off seamlessly if this will happen. Uh, this is my, my backup. I'm going to move this streaming. Right. I think it's worked. All right. Um, let me know. Yep, I think it's working. Okay, cool. All right, so, um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it really is still kind of bewildering that I, I get why people don't like Harris. I don't like Harris. I, I think Harris is awful, and I think she's terrible, and I think her administration is going to be horrible. In comparison to what is the only question, right? Objectively, it's going to be horrible. 
but Trump's going to be potentially worse. And the fact that nobody, the fact that his character is so awful, so horrific, the fact that people, the people can't see that and that that matters really worries me about the American people. Um, Trump is so confident in his debate appearance and the quality of his debate and how well he did in the debate that he has refused a uh, third debate. He, he will not, he does not want a third debate. Um, he is saying, no, I, you know, I won the first debate. Why, I, I won this debate. Why should I do another debate? Actually, a second debate with Harris. Why should I do another debate? I won them both. I won the one with Biden. I won the one with Harris. I don't need to do this again. Probably a good move for Trump. I think, I think he loses another debate. I don't think he can stay disciplined. I don't think he can stay on message. Um, and I think that if nothing happens, right, if we just have, you know, no real news for the next, uh, you know, two months, month and a half, whatever, I think Trump will win. I think that uh, because it, 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 what, what Harris is going to have to do if she wants to win this is going to, she has to, she has to create news. She has to feature herself. She's going to have to do interviews. She's going to have to get in front of the camera. She's going to have to reassure the American people that she is a center. She's going to have to uh, convince them that she's not committed to those crazy 2019 ideas that she had as a senator. She is going to act, have to actively, actively campaign Trump can cruise off of the fact that he is the opposition, that he's anti-Biden, he's anti-Harris, he's anti the last four years. It would have been better if he'd won. Um, now, it, now, of course, if he could stay away from whining and complaining and, and playing the, the victim that would help his cause, I'm not sure he can. But I think the status quo, again, it's elections. What do I know? Uh, place to, to, to Trump's hands. and uh, But right now it's 50-50. It's a toss-up. Throw a coin. Uh, and, and it really is. And it really... It, you really have to... It really is going to boil down to about 100,000 voters in seven states. So what, 10,000 voters, $15,000 in, in, in seven states each. Pretty crazy. Pretty crazy. And that, of course, brings up the question of what happens if it's close. What happens if it's close? And right now, it looks like it's going to be very close. Um, we live in a world in which the American people are super skeptical of the authorities, of our institutions. They're super skeptical of state government, of of election officials, of uh, courts, all the way up to the Supreme Court, left and right, super skeptical. What happens with all these challenges? And they're going to be, a lot of them. And it's going to be more complicated this time, well, more and less complicated in some regards, more complicated this time, because Trump is ready this time. Last time he was winging it. Last time he didn't know quite what he was doing when he was challenging everything. And he was... He also didn't have his people in place. But this time he has his people in place. His people are running a lot of these election committees. I mean, in Georgia, some of the uh, counties are run by Trumpists who might not certify the election if Trump loses their county. Or they might not certify it if he wins by too small of a margin. Or they might just delay and delay, delay, because they now have the new Georgia law allows them to investigate any suspicion of, uh, uh, of, of uh, 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 voter fraud almost indefinitely. So they could just delay, delay, delay. The same is true in Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania. So, so there are real issues with the people in charge. The people in charge are like like Lava Loomers, just miniature Lava Loomers and miniature Marjorie Taylor Greens are running election committees at the county, in some cases, state level. It's not clear that there are enough adults in the room like they were in, in 2020 who actually stood up to Trump and 
and, and did not let him steal the election. Are there any adults in the room who will stand up to him in these states? Have most of them been voted out? What about the courts? Uh, to what extent have the state courts, state Supreme Courts, been politicized? And of course, whatever the Supreme Court rules, is anybody going to trust them? Is anybody going to believe them? Is anybody going to follow them? And, and what are the followers? Antifa on the left, the new right on the right. What is their response going to be if they think that an election is stolen one way or the other? I mean, this election is going to be scary. Somebody I was talking to the other day said, for all we know, you know, some of America's cities are going to be burning a couple of days after the election. I think the election this year is on November 5th. That will be a Tuesday on November 7th on a Thursday. I will actually be in Tennessee on November 5th on Election Day giving a talk, um, hopefully a couple of talks on the 5th and then another talk on the 6th. And then on the 7th, I will be in Denver. And um, on the 7th, I expect to be doing an, a post-election event in Denver in that evening. Uh, and it's, it's, it's going to be interesting. What's the state of the country going to be on the 7th of November? Spooky, spooky stuff. Uh, I, 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 and, and how do we resolve? I mean, we've got the institutions to resolve these election issues. But are they robust enough, given the distrust American people have in them, and given the Trump has stacked the cards? Now, the Democrats are probably doing the same. And one could argue that everybody's prepared this time. That is, everybody's got their lawyers ready. Everybody's got their, I don't know, election observers ready. Everybody's going to be ready to, for suits and countersuits and all of that. It's going to happen in mass. It's going to be frantic. I mean, the, the, the few days after the election are going to be crazy. And it's going to be really interesting to see if anybody can call the election on election night or any time after that, any time soon after that. I can't think of an election... That is going to be, I mean, we had one in, in 2000, right, with, with the hanging chads in, in, um, in Florida. But 2020 wasn't that close in the end. I mean, Fox News called it the night of the election. They called it right. Uh, Florida was in a different time and a different era. Imagine if Florida happened today and it went to the Supreme Court. I, I mean... Al Gore just basically accepted the Supreme Court. Would Kamala? Would the left? Would Trump? Yeah, I mean, it, it, real uncertainty. I know nobody wants to think about it, but real uncertainty, real opportunity for political violence, real opportunity for demonstrations and riots. And, you know, and, and we saw 2020, we saw BLM is quite capable of burning, burning cities. Of, I mean, we don't want to exaggerate, but Portland, Oregon, not, not pretty, not pretty. So Trump is not likely to concede. Now, the good thing is Trump is not the incumbent, so he doesn't have the levers of power. He doesn't have, um, he doesn't have the Justice Department. And, he, and the, the reality is that the vice president, who presides over Congress in making the final call, it will be Kamala Harris, <laughs> funnily enough to make the final call of whether she's president or not. And um, Congress has also tightened up the laws about the role of the vice president, also uh, tighten up the law about whether congressmen can hold up the certification and all that. So uh, we do have a little bit more sanity. There is a little bit more, the institutions are a little bit more prepared uh, this time around uh, for kind of Trumpist insanity. But still, it's, it's going to be suspenseful. Oh, I was going to say something about Millet. I was actually going to start the show with a positive story. And I, I somehow skipped that and went right to the negative. Um, all right, Millet. Uh, 
so the bill would have dramatically raised the pensions of Argentinians uh, to compensate for inflation and everything else. And Millet basically said, look, um, we can't do this. We don't have the money. We're trying to balance the budget. We're trying to have a surplus. We're trying to reform the economy. This is not the time to um, raise people's pensions. Can't do it. And he vetoed it. And at the time, and I said this on the show, I said the problem is that Congress had passed this law with a veto-proof majority. That is, with enough votes to overturn the veto. But Millet hustled. And over the last week, he has lobbied and found congressmen, 87, to 87 in favor of overriding the Millet veto. But that was short of the two-thirds needed. 87 congressmen flipped their votes. Um, uh, you know, and, I, you know, it can be, it's interesting what he had to give to them in order to get them to do But, because the issue itself might be small, what it shows anything else is how committed Millet actually is and how much support he can garner uh, politically, how much support you can garner politically when you're willing to roll up your shirt sleeves and, and actually go and do the work. Something Trump never did when he was president. He never went to Congress and, and cut the kind of deals to get the stuff he needed done. Obamacare was the, was the biggest example of that. He never actually went there and forced it through and, and, and haggled and twisted people's arms and, and, and you know, cut deals with them in order to get his priority legislation passed. Partially because the reality is Trump has no priority legislations because the reality is Trump doesn't believe or care about anything. Zero, zilch, nada, nothing. He, 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 he doesn't care. He's an he's a empty vessel, nothing. He only cares about being liked. He only cares about pleasing a, a certain group of people that he you know, feels the need to please. But that's about it. There's, there's nothing more there. Okay, so that's good news on the Millet front, good news for on the Argentina front, really, and it's, it really is terrific. Um, okay, it froze again. I don't understand. Did you hear it or didn't you hear it? Um, so... Millet basically prevented them from overriding his veto by switching 87 congressmen to his side. The whole Millet segment you missed. That's bizarre. Okay, so here's, here's the quick recap so I don't have to go through the whole thing. Quick recap is, last week I told you Millet had vetoed an increase to the pensions of... Um, of uh, uh, pensioners, government pensions. Uh, he vetoed it on the basis of the government has no money and uh, we, we need to keep a balanced budget, we need surpluses, we need discipline, we cannot increase government spending. Nada. No government spending. He, he, he vetoed it in spite of it being incredibly popular with many Argentinians. But Congress had a veto-proof majority, so they could have overridden his veto. Yesterday, I guess it went to vote in Congress, and they couldn't get the two-thirds votes. In other words, Millet had gone to Congress, negotiated, convinced, twisted people's arms, and ultimately got 87 congressmen to change their minds, and therefore there was no, they, they, they could not override his veto, and therefore pensions are not rising. Great news for Argentina, great news for Millet, and, and great news for Argentina in the big sense that, um, you know, he is uh, the level of commitment that he is showing here uh, and, and, and the extent to which he's, and, and this is the point I want to make, the extent to which he's not a populist. A populist would have said, ah, you know, the people have spoken, people really want this, I'll give it to them. Uh, Ukraine, quick update on Ukraine. Uh, a number of things are happening in Ukraine right now. Uh, one is 
Russians have started a counteroffensive in the Kursk region. Remember, Kursk is that portion of Russia that um, Ukraine actually invaded and managed to take about 500 square miles uh, within Russia. Uh, a counteroffensive, which was expected, has started uh, on multiple fronts in Kursk. It's hard to tell how that is going. Um, it, it does seem like Russians are taking back some territory um, uh, in that area. We'll keep, uh, we'll keep, uh, I'll try to stay updated on that and uh, update you as uh, things change. On the Eastern Front, again, not good news for Ukraine. Uh, the Russians are slowly but systematic look good uh, in the Donetsk area in terms of Ukraine's ability to hold and Ukraine's ability to uh, hold major settlement. Now, there might be a, a major shift uh, today uh, announced out of the uh, out of meetings that are happening right now between Biden and uh, the Prime Minister of the UK. Uh, basically, one of the main issues on their agenda is uh, the Britain would like to uh, allow uh, Ukraine to be able to use its storm shadow cruise missiles on Russian soil. So they want to be able to have Ukraine use it to shoot targets, military targets, in Russia itself. So far, the Ukrainians are being restricted in doing that, and most of those restrictions have come from the United States. And um, it, it, is also, it is also the case that the, 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 uh, the Ukrainians cannot use U.S.-supplied ATCAMs, uh, ballistic mis ta tactical ballistic missiles, also into Russia itself. Uh, so uh, the idea is that Britain uh, is going to use, be able to use the, uh, be able to allow the Ukrainians to use storm shadow, and that the United States will follow uh, with the Ukrainians, uh, follow giving permission to the Ukrainians to use the ATCAMs. Now, in the meantime, Putin is threatening to expand the war. Uh, Putin is threatening today that if Britain and the United States allow Ukraine to use these missiles, he will view that as, a, in a sense, a declaration of war by NATO and will expand to, uh, the war to uh, attack NATO. Now, this is a, a ludicrous threat um, and, a, and an empty threat. It's ludicrous and empty. Uh, it is, uh, it, 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 you know, and the fact that Biden is falling for it is pathetic. Uh, the reality is that Russia cannot take on NATO. It cannot expand its field of operation. The Ukrainians have showed that by the fact that they could take 500 square miles within Russia. Uh, the Ukrainian military is no match for even a weak NATO. Uh, also, the, 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 the Russian economy is struggling. Uh, Russia is struggling to recruit soldiers. Uh, Russia is struggling to produce weapon systems. That's why it has to buy ancient weapon systems from the North Koreans and buy weapon systems from the Iranians and drones from the Iranians. Uh, Russia's in a very weak position. And, but Putin knows that the way domestic po politics in America works, if he threatens, then people like J.D. Vance and people like Jordan Peterson and you know, all the other uh, people who, who like to panic over Russia will immediately declare that Biden is throwing us into a World War III by allowing Ukraine to use these weapons. And uh, it, it, everybody will panic and, and, and Biden will retreat and, and, uh, and not allow it and side with, and, and, you know, side with the, cons with the conservatives, with the, with the uh, yeah, the, the, the pro-Russia side and, and not allow the Ukrainians to use the weapons that America is supplying them to their full ability. Uh, which will be a tragedy because it'll be one more way in which y Ukraine is being hampered and and its hands are being tied and it can't it, it's not being allowed to win it's not being being allowed to to actually fight the Russians. Uh, so Putin is playing a game. He knows the game well. It's a kind of a propaganda game, uh, and uh, Biden's no match. Neither is Trump, of course, as we saw yesterday. Trump's uh, solution to Ukraine is basically for Ukraine to surrender. Uh, so, uh, you know, th this is where we are kind of uh, in the Ukraine. We'll see later today what, uh, what uh, Biden and uh, uh, 
uh, and uh, Starmer, the uh, UK Prime Minister, decide, hopefully they decide to provide Ukraine uh, with the permission to use the missiles uh, and that Ukraine could start defending itself properly. Just on, this, on, on, the, on the issue of, of Russia's <coughs> struggling economy, I will note that today the Russian Central Bank raised its key interest rate by 1% to 19%. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of funny, because we in the United States are bitterly complaining about a uh, interest rate of 5% and mortgage rates of 7 8%. Can you imagine what mortgage rates are in Russia right now? 19%. 19%. If that doesn't have a crippling impact on the Russian economy, on the quality and standard of living on Russians, then what would? Right? Inflation, by the way, uh, is running at 9%. So you've got 9% inflation, 9% inflation, which is bad, um, but it's 9%. Interest rates are at 16%. 7% above inflation. Uh, not good for the domestic economy. Now, it, it's absolutely true that uh, the labor market in Russia is still tight because the government is, uh, you know, hiring a lot of people to build weapon systems. And it's true that a lot of Russians are the front dying for their country. Uh, but the standard of living, quality of life, real incomes of actual Russians, not good. Not good. And the idea that Russia could then afford to engage in an all-out war with NATO, yeah, it's, it's a joke. And uh, somebody, should, somebody needs, I mean, Biden, Biden of all people, needs to call Putin's bluff. Need to call Putin's bluff because it's a bluff. It's nothing more than that. Uh, all right, let's see. Um, that is Ukraine. Yeah, yesterday, yesterday or the day before, I can't remember, we talked about Draghi, the former uh, head of the uh, European Central Bank, came out with a report the United States and, 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 and China that um, basically Europe was becoming irrelevant to the global economy because of its uh, falling behind it primarily on, on tech, innovation, increased productivity, you know, growth. One of the areas that the report highlights is AI, is artificial intelligence. Basically, AI today is dominated, dominated by the United States, both in terms of investment, both in terms of outcomes, in terms of the number of people working at it. I mean, in every respect, the United States is dominating the field. Second comes in, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, China. According to the Drug Review Report, 73% of foundational AI models were developed in the United States, 73%. And another 15% in China. That's together 88%. I don't know where the rest are. Maybe, maybe Israel has a couple of percent and maybe then Europe. Europe is lagging hugely behind. It has the population of the United States. It has the, the, the educated, it has an educated population, educated in STEM. So it has other components except for one. They have stifled AI development because of their regulations. A few months ago, I told you about the fact that uh, the EU uh, passed something called the General Data Protection Regulation, the AI Act, and Digital Market Acts, and Digital Services Act. These are all acts regulating tech. And the consequence of that is that there's no tech innovation. The consequence of that is there are not very many tech startups. The consequence of that is the venture capital has left Europe to the extent that they're worried about the collapse of startups in China, the complete collapse, disaster. Uh, and, uh, and, and that is all true. But we're seeing a very similar collapse in Europe because of the same causes, government intervention. Government regulations, government control, government attempts to control an industry in China, government attempts to regulate an industry out of existence in Europe. 
this is from the report I'm quoting. The risk is for Europe to be totally dependent on AI, model, AI models designed and developed abroad for both general purpose AI and progressively for vertical uses dedicated to crucial EU sectors, including the automotive, banking, telecom, health, mobility, and retail industries. As AI is very dependent on upfront R&D investment, lower private investments weigh again on the EU's competitive position. So what this basically is saying is the reason for all of this is that private investment in the EU is not going into these sectors. Why? Why is it going into these sectors in the United States? Because people are confident that in the United States, you can develop a product, you can bring it to market, and you can potentially make money at it. So they're willing to invest. They don't guarantees, but there's a potential. In Europe, because of the regulations, regulations limit the ability to develop, to produce, and to bring to market products because of the regulations. And the regulations make it super expensive if you're going to try that all these restrictions are basically making it impossible for EU companies to compete, to even get started. And as a consequence, private investment has dried up. Private venture capital is not willing to do it. So the only hope that I think some of the, the writers of the, these reports are saying is, well, what we need is public investment, government money. But government money distorts. Government money puts the, the, the ability to... Uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, choose winners and losers up to the government. And that is, that is, turns out to be just central planning and turns out to be a disaster. You don't want government making the investments. You want private investors making it based on the profit motive, which is the motive that dictates success. To quote the report again, quote, as in global AI competition, winner take most dynamics already prevailing. The EU faces now an unavoidable trade-off between stronger ex-ante regulatory safeguards for fundamental rights and product safety, I don't know what fundamental rights have to do with this, and more rugged regulatory light-handed rules to promote EU investment and in innovation. In other words, they have to decide whether they're, they're interested in competing or not, or whether they're giving up. Just a quick story on AI. Um, there was a, a new AI product launch. Um, according to this article, AI product that claims is capable of reasoning. It's not capable of reasoning, let me say that. But it's more advanced uh, in the sense that it can solve harder problems in math, coding, and science. Um, it, is, uh, it is known as O1. And it's going to be added to... ChatGPT Plus, uh, starting on Thursday, uh, next Thursday, I guess. Uh, the, so it's going to be integrated into ChatGPT Plus. It's really mostly for use of scientists, developers, uh, not so much for kind of the general public who's just going to ask it questions to, uh, that it that then you can copy paste into your exam. Uh, it is it is much more oriented towards engineers and scientists and, and, and software developers. It's one more step towards creating uh, AI agents, which is what kind of the, 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 I think financially the holy grail um, is, is an agent that you can give it instructions and it goes out and actually does stuff in the world, in the digital world, but still in the world. We're not quite there yet in terms of AI being able to get us closer to that. So uh, O1 is the new um, greatest and uh, coolest ChatGPT new feature that they are adding. All right, let's go back to the EU. So one of the amazing strengths of the EU, really the best things about the EU, uh, the fact that it is, a, um, it is a zone where there is free movement of capital, of goods, and of labor. That is that people can move, they can work in the region, which includes uh, for example, non-EU countries like Switzerland. And, and one of the amazing things as a consequence of you just walk in because you came from a Shenzhen country and the, 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 the screening that happens when you come in to the EU happens in the first port of entry, the first country you enter. 
And when you drive from Austria to Germany to France to Spain to wherever, nobody stops you. There's no border controls. Uh, you know, sometimes they put up something where they're, they're kind of peeking into your car. I guess maybe they're looking for terrorists or something. But, but generally, there's just no controls. It's just open. And it gives you a sense of freedom that is un, un, incredibly valuable. And I think Europeans have forgotten what it's like to stand in lines for passport controls and what it's stand in lines and cars and have customs search you and, and check your passports and check your documents. Uh, and the Schengen, this idea of you know, open movement of people within this greater European area, is a huge boon to the uh, European economy, uh, to, uh, I think, to the European psyche. Well, as a consequence of uh, some, of the, uh, some of the attacks by migrants in Germany, the knife attacks that we've seen, Germany is considering reimposing border controls and suspending the Schengen system of passport-free travel. The German government has obviously come under pressure about these uh, attacks uh, to put border controls and to stop immigrants from coming into Germany. Now, these immigrants managed to get into some European country before they make it to Germany, but now Germany wants to stop them from coming into Germany. Now, you know, one way they could do that is by eliminating the welfare benefits they get because Germany is incredibly generous in terms of the welfare benefits that they are providing uh, asylum seekers and pretty much any immigrants that want to come in. They hand them a check. They hand them housing. They, you know, it's just a free fall. You can give them whatever they want. That would be the main thing they could do to stop the immigrants from coming there. It's always interesting that during the 2015 mass migration of Muslims into Europe, they didn't want to go to Hungary. They didn't even want to go to Denmark. They kind of traveled right through Denmark and to Sweden, right? Because all these borders are open, so they can just travel through them. They didn't stop in Denmark. They didn't stop in... They didn't go to Poland. They didn't go to Spain. They went straight to Sweden and straight to Germany. Why did they go to Germany and Sweden? Because Germany and Sweden gave them the best welfare deal, and they all knew it. That is, the information had gotten to the migrants that that's where you get the sweetest deal, you get accommodation, you get a check, don't have to work, it's where you get the welfare. You want to stop migrants coming to Germany? Stop that. Um, the main problem Germany has is Islamic extremists, Islamists inside Germany. And the way to deal with them is to deal with them, is to deal with Islamism. It's to acknowledge the problem and to start dealing with them, and to start figuring out who are the migrants that are associated with this ideology. And if they are associated with this ideology, this particular ideology, because this particular ideology is a threat to civilization, kick them out. Kick them out. Or, you know, if they're actually planning something, arrest them. Certainly monitor them and screen them and follow them. Make it clear to the Islamists not just Muslims, but the Islamists, they will never succeed in Germany. They will never be able to take over. Their terrorist attacks are for nothing. And I think it, it can be done, and it can be done, uh, it can be done effectively. It's not like these Islamists are hiding right now. They're out in the open. With, and, and what the West should do, what the West as a, as a broad unit should do, is declare war against Islamism, declare Islamism an unacceptable idea within Europe. You know, Islamism is a physical, military, terrorist threat to the lives of their own citizens and expel them. But for that, you have to have a... You have to declare war. You have to declare war. So uh, you, 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 it's not yet violent. It would, if you gave it political power and, and with the right circumstance, could become violent. But right now, extreme Christianity is not violent, and therefore uh, you don't have to deal with it. There might become a day where you will have to deal with extreme Christianity. 
right now, the physical problem, the, the, the people that actually pose a threat, a physical threat to Westerners are Islamists. These are Iranian, the people uh, inspired by the Iranian regime, funded by the Iranian regime, inspired by the groups that you should declare as unacceptable. All right, we got acting up again. WCZN is uh, traveling the world and uh, based on my mandate, I told him to travel the world. I I'm curious if you could share with us WCZN two things, because he's in Sweden right now, two things. One is where have you been? Where has my travel the world mandate taken you, um, what are some of your favorite places, and what currently is your impression of Sweden, given that we get so much negative news out of Sweden? Anyway, this proposal about Schengen doing away with the passport-free movement uh, across German border would be an absolute disaster. It would uh, cause other countries to do the same thing. And um, <laughs> Hunter Hunter wants me to move to Alabama. Sorry, Hunter Hunter, that ain't happening for all kinds of reasons. Alabama is not on my list um, of places to come. There, there are lots of places with good Wi-Fi. Home, for example, in Puerto Rico, has great great internet connection. All I need is a cable. If you know, next time when I rent a place for a long period of time. I will try to get wired internet. That, that is ultimately the secret for stable internet connection, is not to have to rely on Wi-Fi, but actually have a, uh, a, a cable internet connection. Um, other countries are going to do the same thing. You're going to get Austria, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary, uh, Croatia, and then, of course, you'll have France and, and Spain, and everybody will join in, and you'll destroy the better part of the EU. You'll keep the garbage of the EU, which is what Brexit did, kept the garbage of the EU and destroyed the good stuff of the EU. That's why Brexit is an unmitigated failure, because it kept all the regulations. And now the UK has a leftist government that will actually increase those regulations. And it destroyed the, the good, the, the, the free movement of, of labor, goods, and capital. Um, yeah, this, this would be horrible if it happens. Let's hope it doesn't happen. Um, German government does not have to change the law to do this. Uh, and, um, yep, we, we, we will see. We will see if it happens and, and what the consequences are. But again, this is one of the good things. Of, this is one of the few benefits of the EU, and they're going to destroy it. Uh, all right. Uh, yeah, okay, two stories... As I've said earlier, um, Atul Khomeini, Iran right now has the, uh, Khamenei, not Khomeini, uh, Iran has the capability of building a bomb in a matter of weeks, in a matter of weeks. And, uh, you know, supposedly, you know, do it, right? Put it in, fast forward and actually get a bomb built. I mean, they're really afraid to do that because if they get the built, bomb built, the sanctions will be overwhelming, and they, and they worry about their economy. Now, that is a little less of a consideration now that they have this very cozy deal with the Russians. But, and, and who knows, the Russians might be telling them, slow down. But one of the considerations could very well be who's going to win the election. So one speculation is no rush. They'll try to negotiate a deal with the Kamala administration, uh, Kamala's um, foreign policy uh, advisors are quite enamored with Iran. They're very friendly to Iran. They are the same people who got the Obama deal done way back then, which was very positive for Iran. Iran really liked that deal. It allowed them to build... It basically it didn't explicitly do this, but implicitly allowed them to, d to build the bomb later, but in the meantime got them off of all the sanctions and they could accumulate money. Uh, they believe they could cut the same deal with Kamala. And particularly if they behave themselves now with Israel and they don't attack Israel and if they, if they uh, you know, if, if, if they can just get by this election. 
uh, they think Trump, well, Trump is also eager to cut a deal with Iran. They think Trump will be more difficult. So the idea is that if come election time, the Iranians believe that Trump will be elected, they will fast track the bomb. Right? Uh, so uh, if she wins, Iran doesn't need to build a bomb right now. It'll postpone it into the future, right? Um, and, uh, and if Trump wins, they fast-track the bomb. That's the general idea. You know, I hope Israel is watching the same dynamic and is ready to, as soon as the Iranians accelerate or move into bomb production mode, Israel takes them out. Because that is the only hope we have. Americans won't, not under Biden, not under Trump. So w w the Israelis will have to do it themselves. And, and they, they might have to do it before the U.S. election if the sense is that Trump is going to win. Um, all right. I don't know what you guys have about Alabama. Leave Alabama alone. I'm not moving to Alabama. That is 100% certainty. It will never happen. Uh, but um, but let's, not, let's not slam Alabama. Leave it at that. <laughs> Hunter Hunter's there. Um, a final good story. Uh, and by the way, very few Super Chat questions today. Don't know what's going on today. But you guys are just, you know, uh, 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 pinching those dollars or whatever, holding back. I mean, very few. I've got all the Super Chats from before. Um, and uh, it's weird. I thought I saw Wes come in with, a, uh, with support, and I don't see it here. So maybe, maybe it didn't. Uh, capture everything, but it ca caught all the questions. But um, I don't see some of the stickers that were on the other chat uh, don't seem to be here. Anyway, we, we, I'll, I'll take that into account. But anyway, even with that, way behind, guys. So uh, if you want the show to continue beyond the next 10 minutes, you got to ask questions because I have like three questions. It's going to be very quick. We're going to get through it very quickly. All right, final positive story. Uh, Penn, uh, uh, University of Pennsylvania, one of uh, a major institution and uh, pro Hamas uh, demonstrations and, and, and uh, tent cities and all of that. Um, uh, so uh, uh, Penn has announced that they will stop issuing political statements. They will stop taking positions. Now, it'll be really interesting if we get another BLM-like thing, a leftist thing, if they stick to it, if they stick to it, but it does, the following Harvard, which made the same announcement, uh, you remember Penn, the, the president had to resign, um, they're taking the position that Chicago has had for a long time. You know, we're not in the business of making public policy statements. We're in the business of education. We'll stick to education. And we don't take sides on public issues one way or the other. Um, so they have announced, several universities now have announced that they are stop issuing random public statements. Um, and uh, particularly, uh, now we'll see again what happens with a BLM-like event uh, and what happens with an October 7th-like event. Uh, here's what the University of Pennsylvania said. The university will issue messages on local or world events rarely, and only when those events lie within our operational remit. That's interesting. What does the operational remit include? So this is only partially good, right? Because they've left themselves an opening. But it would be good to get university administrations out of the business of public policy and back into the business of education. Now, this isn't going to solve any of our problems because I don't think there's any energy behind changing the dynamics of our educational system. There doesn't seem to be any, seem to be any energy about you know, changing kind of the, what's being taught in the classroom that led to the disastrous protests and, and the anti-Semitism and the 
hours on American campuses. Uh, so, uh, yep. Uh, but it's good. It's good to have these universities back off. Back off and stay off. Right? Stay off. All right, since we have so few Super Chat questions, and you guys, um, uh, I don't need anything. Um, do you go, when you, when you buy, so John's money? No, you trade with them. You're getting a value from them, and you provide a value, and, and that value is denominated in dollars. Now, it's true that I'm providing this for free, but I am providing you with a value. You obviously listen, therefore, it's a value to you. Even if you disagree, you're receiving a value. And I think any, you know, any reasonable person says, yeah, if I'm getting a value, I'd like to pay for it. I'd, I'd like to contribute towards the production of that value. I don't want to be, in a sense, a free ride off of this. And I appreciate that he gives it for free, but I should contribute something towards it. So it's not an issue of what I need. It's an issue of, are we trading or are we not trading? Is this a one-sided thing or is it not a one-sided thing? Now, you guys might be completely comfortable, and I'm fine with that, um, with, I think, trade uh, relationships are healthier for both parties than non-trading relationships. So I encourage that. And, and the show is, in the end, made possible through this, your support. If, if your support stops, very clearly, if your support stops, I will stop the show. I, I'm not going to do this if I'm not going to get paid for it. So, uh, so basically, those of you who are paying, those of you who are supporting the show, are making this show possible. And those of you who are not should at the very least thank the people who are paying for it because you're benefiting from it. So that's the reasoning. I don't think it's that complicated or, or that difficult. All right, two more stories since we don't have a lot of questions. One is... Um, you remember during COVID, everybody was moving out of California and they were going to Miami and they were going to uh, Austin. And, and, you know, there's lots of reasons to go to Austin. And, and given, uh, given Austin's uh, uh, tech industry, lots of reasons to be invested in Austin. But Miami never struck me as a place that's going to be big in the high tech market. It never struck me as a place that's going to do really well, even, even though it's not... Uh, you know, even though um, uh, a lot of people wanted to move there and uh, a lot of people supposedly wanted to escape San Francisco. The reality is there's no network there. There are no high-end programmers. And this was made real by the fact that a venture capitalist firm, Andreessen Horowitz, who opened an office in Miami during COVID, have now left. They've closed the office and left. The reality is that most of the investments, overwhelming majority of the investments, are made in San Francisco, are made in the Bay Area, in Silicon Valley. And that Florida just is not very hospitable to venture capitalists. Yes, it's hot. Yes, it's cool. Yes, they have great nightclubs and restaurants. Rest nightclubs, I am told, I've never been to one. Um, and that maybe that doesn't exist in San Francisco. But when it comes to venture capital, Miami ain't the place. Not the place. Don't go there. And finally, um, there is news coming out of our universities. Uh, this is the first year where universities, the first semester, where universities are admitting students and they are barred from using affirmative action criteria. They are barred from taking into consideration the race of the applicant. And guess what's happening? <laughs> I think it's quite obvious what's happening. Um, one group of students enrollment is way up. Asians. It appears, at least, uh, at Brown University. And this is what Brown University has to say. This is the Brown Daily Herald. Herald's first year poll also outlined early warning signs of marked decreases in the share of black and Hispanic students and an increase in Asian students. Horrible. We should run. Run for the hills. So, yes, there are warning signs of increase in Asian students at universities. I'm sure that's a surprise. I mean, we didn't see that coming. 
I mean, Asians study harder, invest more. Education is super crucial to them. And they do better in school and they do better and, and therefore they get into these universities. And if pretty much anybody, then anybody could be, do well. But um, we should penalize them for studying hard and really, really, really devoting themselves to their education by kicking them out because it's an early warning sign that Asians are coming in. Last time I look, Asians were a minority too. You see, it's not about the minority status. It's all about oppressor oppressed. And the only way to tell if you're an oppressor or an oppressed is how successful you are. And by definition, if you're successful, you're an oppressor. If you're a failure, you're oppressed. Therefore, Asians, successful, successful immigrants, done well in America, a, a high educational standards, high relative income, and therefore they might be oppressors. Uh, Hispanics, blacks, not done so well, lower incomes, therefore they must be oppressed. Oppressors, oppressed. That's the only standard the left understands. All right, Asians are coming to take over our universities. Be aware. Uh, let's see, cover that, cover that, cover that. Close that. Let's move out. Super chat in, uh, not that window. Super chat window into the relevant place right there, and then we'll, we'll take your questions. I see a few people added questions. Uh, it would be nice to see some $20 questions up there. 50, 100, 200, 500, something. Um, I saw a lot of stickers, so thank you to all the people who gave stickers. Uh, Neffel, Mary Lean, John Bales, um, uh, Caroline, uh, Martin, Stephen Harper, Martin, Jeff Bannister, uh, Mary Lean again, Robert, um, and I know myself to have skipped some in the transition between the two feeds, Mary Lean again, uh, and Savanos start us off with the sticker. So thank you all. And I know we missed a few, so uh, I apologize to those of you. Thank you to everybody who did a sticker today uh, who's on. All right, let's start with uh, Paul. Um, and uh, Paul says, what is going on with the ICC and the ICJ investigations of genocide against Israel? I think they're still investigating. I think that uh, South Africa was supposed to submit a brief with information proving that Israel was committing genocide. Uh, it has struggled uh, to uh, produce that on time. They've asked for an extension. I think they've been giving an extension, so that's going on. So, it's, so a lot of stuff is going on in the background, but um, I mean, they don't have a case. It doesn't mean they won't make up a case. It doesn't mean they won't invent a case. They, it doesn't mean that they won't come up with something, but they're struggling to invent a case against Israel. And, uh, but there's a, a, a lot of activity going on in the background. Um, so... Uh, it has not gone away. Um, RDF, why is China doing so well building EVs, subsidies? I mean, there are a number of things going on, I think, in China. Um, I think there's every reason to believe that they have either been granted or they have stolen some of the EV IP from Tesla. Remember, Tesla has a huge... Uh, EV plant in China. Uh, Elon Musk has really, really good relationships with the Chinese authorities. And it could very well be that, is, that he cut a deal with the Chinese to give them some of Tesla's IP or that the Chinese just stole it. Um, and so one is they had a shortcut to the IP. A second is uh, they've subsidized it. They've subsidized it by a variety of different means. Some of it's direct subsidies. Um, and uh, some of it is um, uh, direct subsidies and, uh, and, and from, from, from the government uh, to the manufacturers of themselves. I don't know if they have like tax credits for people who buy EVs, uh, but they've made it really, really, really easy for EV manufacturers to build EVs. Now, let me just say this, because I, I, I don't want to completely um, claim that the Chinese are only copying. 
The reality is that the Chinese are very good at taking some basic technology, taking somebody else's IP, the basic stuff. Uh, yeah, Z400 Racer says Tesla open sources its patents. So they haven't stolen anything. They just take the patents. They've, everything's open sourced. So they take it and they improve on it. They're very good at that. Excellent engineers. Just devoted incredible resources to figuring this out. And, and some of these EVs coming out of China are very, very good. They're of, of high quality. They, they would probably beat Tesla in a true market match. They're certainly beating them in China. Tesla sales in China are struggling and other car companies in China are rising. Uh, Tesla are still significantly more expensive than some of the Chinese EVs, even though the Chinese EVs on, on quality are up there, really up there. Um, so, you know, China has industrial policy. China chooses certain industries and favors them with tax breaks and subsidies and all kinds of things and, and pours resources into them and gets them going. And uh, they chose EVs. By the way, one other element. China has no electricity problem. And for two reasons, two reasons. They don't have an electricity problem, one, because they have a relatively new, um, new infrastructure. Their, their, their electricity grid is relatively new. Remember that just 50 years ago, they didn't need much electricity. There was not much electricity being produced and being delivered. And, they had to build that up over the last 50 years, over the last, particularly over the last, well, less than 50 years, 40 years, 30 years, 20 years. So they have a new ele electrical infrastructure, which allows them to have charging stations and allows them to provide the infrastructure for EVs and, and, and make it possible for people to buy them. So uh, the other thing that EV manufacturers in China have an advantage is they can build in scale and sell in scale. They can build lots of cars and sell lots. There's lots of electricity. Natural gas doesn't do a lot of natural gas because they don't have a lot of natural gas and, and they don't want to become dependent on the Russians. They have some ESG, but not a lot. They build coal, coal, coal they can access. So they build coal plants. They also have no problem building massive quantities of nuclear power plants. So China has no problem building power plants and providing energy. This will give it an, an advantage when it comes to AI as well and building the massive data centers that AI requires, which require electricity. They'll just build them. They'll just build the, the nuclear power plants that they require. They'll build the coal plants that they require. So China has the infrastructure that makes EVs practical. Imagine if tomorrow everybody in the United States wanted an EV. You couldn't have one because you can't charge them. There's not enough electricity in America. If all of us started plugging our cars in, the grid would collapse. The grid would literally collapse. It's just we don't produce enough electricity in America for everybody to have an electric car. In China, they do. And they're building more, much more capacity. We're not. We just are not. Yeah, Luca says they're building a lot of coal plants. A lot, yes. Because they signed Paris or whatever, but they don't care. They don't... They don't I mean, the bad guys never actually live up to the agreements they sign. You know, this is the whole joke about Geneva Conventions and other conventions. Bad guys don't care about conventions. They do what they need to do. So they don't care about treaties. And nobody's going to call them on it. So, you know, they, they built the electric infrastructure to make EVs plentiful. And, you know... There's nothing to say that EVs don't make sense as an automobile at some point if you have enough electricity and if you can make them cheap and efficient enough. Right now, the United States, Europe cannot do that. I mean, Europe barely has enough energy to keep the lights on. California, Texas barely have enough energy to keep the lights on. And one of the reasons is we're not investing in coal plants. We shouldn't. We should be really investing huge amounts in natural gas. Natural gas is cheap in the United States. It's plentiful in the United States because, because of fracking. And we should be building massive quantities of you know, natural gas power plants. Instead, we're building windmills and solar panels. 
Texas is the biggest state in the country for windmills and solar panels. And guess who has one of the least reliable grids in the country? Texas. California is doing better than Texas when it comes to reliable energy this year, at least. So anyway, uh, that, that's, I think, my explanation for what's going on in China. All right. Um, Thomas says, is it appropriate for a three-year-old to color on the walls, their room only, understanding self-expression? I, I think you can decide, yes, you can color on your walls in your room, but not on these other walls. You can color with certain colors that we can paint over, but not with other colors that maybe you can't paint over with. And you, the point is to set rules and to set limits and to respect them and to be consistent about them. And it's not about property rights because they have no real conception of property rights. I mean, you could start telling them this is your room, but then do you really want to say you can do whatever you want in here? I don't think so. Not when you probably have to go in there and tidy after them, at least until a certain age. So ultimately, that room is yours. Your kid doesn't have a property right over his room. Uh, you're not going to allow him to do certain things in that room that you do not approve of. So I wouldn't use the property rights issue too strongly. It's more an issue of, you know, self-expression and why not, right? <laughs> What's the principle that says you can't draw on walls? And later on, you know, you might, he want, might be more, you know, you and he might agree that neatness is more important and let's paint over what you colored and we'll take photographs to keep it, but paint over it. So I, 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 think, I think you have to think about it right. Don't, don't overplay the property rights card because it'll come back to bite you. Um, he doesn't own his room. I mean, when he's 18 or 19 and you want him out of the house, he's going to say, you told me my entire life I own this room. Why can't I stay? Because he doesn't own the room. You own the room. Uh, you own the house. You get a set of rules. But you could set the rule as... You can do what you want with your walls. You can paint them any color you want. You can do what you want. You can put any pictures you want up. And when you're really, really young, you can draw on the walls. But that's set the rule and be consistent with it. That's what's important. Hopefully that's helpful, Thomas. Mary Bands, coded message to philosophy at work. Please don't eat our orange tabby. Is tabby a cat? I guess the cat. He may look like a turkey, but he's actually a cat. Oh, God. Now she's causing me to think about a cat looking like a turkey. Can a cat look like a turkey? What would a cat look like to be looking like a turkey? I don't know. Very confusing. All right. WCZN. I, I got to his message, but he, he actually, okay. WCZN says, being through Southeast Asia, Vietnam, Cambodia, Thailand, Greece, Italy next. Wow. Sweden feels very safe. Clean, beautiful. My sample of location is biased, though. Where in uh, Sweden? I assume you're in Stockholm. Um, I wonder if you've been to, uh, um, uh, what's the city in the south um, near Copenhagen? Um, God. What's the city in the south of Sweden near Copenhagen that, that seems to have more trouble with their Muslims? Um, I forget. Uh, that's fascinating. So I, I, I've never been to Vietnam. Uh, I, I'd like to go one day. Don't know if I will, but Malmo. Think about Malmo versus, uh, versus uh, uh, Stockholm or wherever it is you are. Uh, I'm curious what you thought of Vietnam. I've been to Cambodia. I like Cambodia. I mean, I wouldn't want to live there or anything. Thailand was amazing. I, I love the Thai. And, and, and it's, just a, it's just a relaxing, beautiful place with beautiful people who are experts at customer service, if you will. I mean, the, the, the hospitality, hotels and places like that, there's nothing like Thailand. Greece is beautiful, so I'm glad, I, I'm glad you enjoyed Greece. I hope you enjoyed Greece. I don't know that you enjoyed it, you haven't said. And um, Italy next. Italy's amazing. And you should travel around Italy. Don't go to one place in Italy. I mean, Italy's very different. Milan is very different than Rome, and you got to go to Florence and my next big place in Italy that I want to spend a little time is in is uh, Naples. I want to spend some time in Naples. But this is great. I'm I'm I hope you're happy that I inspired you to travel. I hope you're 
reaping benefits from that fact. So um, that, that, that is great. Andrew, why does the left fail to extend the principle of freedom from government interference from a woman's body to economic regulations? Does that imply a mind-body dichotomy in the realm of commerce? Well, you know, it's, why don't they? Um, you have to ask yourself why they, uh, they support a woman's right to an abortion. And they support a woman's right to an abortion not because they have a principle of freedom. Not because they have a principle of the freedom for a woman to do what she wishes with her body. They're not supporting legalization of drugs. They're not supporting legalization of prostitution. Uh, they're not supporting uh, a legalization of contract law for wages. The, they are, this is a, 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 a uh, this comes out of the sexual revolution. It comes out of, of uh, you know, the whole feminist woman independent. And it's, and much of what motivates it is a subjectivism around those ideas. You know, it, it is, as the conservatives criticize them often, there is an element among the left that it is about, uh, you, know, I, I, you know, I want to be able to have sex with whoever I want under whatever circumstances I want. I want to be able to both debate whenever I want. Uh, it's just an issue of whim and, and, and doing whatever the hell you want. And, uh, but, but I want the government to protect me from those capitalists. I don't want to have to use my mind. So getting pregnant, having sex, and having an abortion are not considered things of the mind. They're considered things of emotion, things of whim. Uh, and, they're not cons and, and, and they don't conceive of them as, they conceive of them as freedom, of freedom to emote. Freedom to be, um, was it Apollo versus Dionysus was Ayn Rand's, to be Dionysus. And now we have an actual defense of abortion that is based on reason, that is based on thinking, that is based on values, that is not based on whim. But the reality is the left doesn't, not really. And it's not what led them to this view, right? And, and by the way, you know, the whole abortion thing wasn't a big deal until the 1970s. And, and it wasn't clear how it was going to pan out in terms of who would support what. At the beginning, the evangelicals, for example, didn't seem to, they didn't make a big deal out of abortion when Roe versus Wade came, it was passed. It's only much later in the 70s that they flip. And even the Catholic Church has gone, I think, back and forth on this. So, um, so they don't have a principle that then they're being inconsistent about. They just don't have a principle. So, you know, generally, you know, uh, um, what the left cares about is emotion and whim. It cares about what, I'll put it this way, where the left wants government to leave you alone is with regard to things like emotion and whim and um, the spiritual stuff, at least traditionally. Take away the woke people, traditionally. And when they want to control is what they think is really important, and that is the material realm, the economy. And this is Marx, right? Marx doesn't believe in a spirit. He believes everything is material, the economy is everything, and therefore the economy must be controlled. The conservatives, by the way, the flip side, they don't care about the economy, so that's why you can have freedom there. What they care about is the spirits. They want to control it. Abortion is viewed in that sense as a spiritual thing. And it's just that the left doesn't care. Atheism breeds self-worship, selfishness. I wish atheism bred selfishness. I mean, the problem in the world today is people are not selfish enough. People are not take their own self seriously enough. They don't, I mean, if you want to use the term self-worship, they don't worship themselves enough. They don't value themselves enough. They don't have enough self-esteem. They don't care enough about themselves. What the world needs is more 
selfishness, more self-esteem, more self-respect, more people caring about themselves. Because if they cared about themselves, they wouldn't do the stupid things that they do. They wouldn't vote for the stupid people they vote for. I mean, the, 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 I wish... Now, the thing is that atheism doesn't tell you anything because atheism is just empty content. You can be an atheist and be a whim worshiper. You can a be an atheist and be rational. You can be an atheist and be a cultural Christian. You can be an atheist and be anything. Atheism is just a negation of God. It's not anything positive. To be selfish is a positive. It requires rationally figuring out, using your mind to figure out what's good for you. That's not easy. Not easy. It takes effort. You need to be really thoughtful. But to be selfish is not to be short-sighted. It's to be long-sighted. To be short-sighted is to be self-destructive. To be short-sighted is, is to undermine your well-being. Undermine your happiness. Undermine yourself. Selfishness actually means rational, long-term, thoughtful, using reason. Confusions about selfishness are endless, sadly. We, we, this, uh, WCZN's travels. He says, all of Southeast Asia felt alive, vibrant. I loved Vietnam. Great people, beautiful landscapes, especially in North. Building everywhere. People want to grow motivated. Yeah, I mean, that's how I felt about Asia when I went there, particularly China. But, but even in places like Thailand and Cambodia, which are less dynamic, there's a vibrancy. There's relations younger and uh, very energized. And I believe that Vietnam is very much like China in that sense, or very much like China was in that sense, of vibrancy and excitement and growth and ambition, ambition, energy, ambition driven by energy. Thank you, WCZN, for your updates. Would love to continue to get updates as you travel around the world. Tell us what it's like. Tell us what you like, what you don't like about the different places. That would be great. That'd be great. Um, uh, let's see. Who do we have? Frank. I think Malay should sign the pension bill, then start making cuts to services to find dollars to pay for it. Also, is Russian nuclear arsenal reliable? No, I mean, I completely disagree with you about, about uh, Argentina. Why? Why should the pensioners get money but others get cut? Why should the government be providing pensions at all? Okay, made some commitments, so it needs to live up to those commitments, but it needs to live up to the minimal commitment. Why should, you sub why should young people subsidize old people? Why should people who are working subsidize people who are not? Why should you cut what is actually good for the economy for the sake of something that is just a drag on the economy like pensions? So no, I I'm, I'm really, really glad that Millet is cutting something that is so popular, like pensions. It shows he has balls. It shows he has courage. It shows he's truly committed. Now, there are lots of other things he needs to do, but this is one way in which he shows his integrity, and good for him for doing that. I think it's really, really, really important and really valuable. And then you say, is uh, uh, Russia's nuclear arsenal reliable? Probably not, but nobody wants to test it. Uh, and it doesn't take... You know, let's say only 10% of the missiles launch. It still wipes out the human race, maybe, potentially. Everybody dies. So you don't want to test it. And you don't want to launch even if only some will actually succeed in going and actually doing what they're supposed to do. Um, Robbie, uh, why not like libertarians. They seem so close to objectivists. That's why I don't like them. Be but they deceive people by seeming close, and that is very destructive. Libertarianism is very far from objectivism. Libertarianism has no objective standards. It has no standards for the truth. It is a ideology that is dominant, almost exclusively political, but even in politics, there's no standard by which to judge anything. Otherwise, you couldn't explain why libertarians can be anarchists. 
Anarchist is the, anarchism is the worst form of government possible. It is the absolute opposite of objectivism. And yet libertarians think it's close to objectivism. No, it's the exact opposite. It's an other extreme. In terms of human flourishing, it's more like communism and fascism than it is like objectivism. And of course, libertarians have no moral code. They have no epistemology. They have no idea on how to get to the truth, what the truth is, what the purpose of life should be, how one should live our lives. And these are the important issues. The politics are less important. The one thing that libertarians rally around, the politics, is the least interesting thing of all the things that philosophy and life have to offer. So I don't like libertarians because they're obsessed with politics. They tend to be anarchists, which is awful. And they, um, they, they turn their backs to real philosophical knowledge, to, 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 to what really matters, how to live your life, ethics, how to know things, epistemology, these, and, and, you know, what kind of art to like, aesthetics. These are the things that, value, that matter, much more than politics does. Um, uh, Let's see, Michael says, is the Overton window a thing? Would objectivism such a thing that could work on Republicans or the culture in general? Would objectivism such a thing? I don't understand the question. So is the Overton window a thing? Yes, I think it is. The Overton window is basically the set, the, 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 the kind of ideas that are acceptable in the culture, that people are willing to think about, willing to consider, willing to engage with. And it can shift, right? You know, clearly Trump has expanded the Overton window, particularly with regard to certain right-wing ideas. Now, I'm not sure what the question is about objectivism. I don't think objectivism is in the Overton window. Self-interest, selfishness, rational self-interest is not in the Overton window. Uh, An epistemology dedicated to reason is moderately in the Overton window, moderately. Uh, a politics of laissez-faire capitalism is not in the Overton window right now. It was maybe 10 years ago. It's not today. I mean, that's something where Trump shrunk the Overton window. When it comes to economic liberty, Trump had the impact of shrinking the Overton window because basically he excluded the free market as from his coalition, if you think. Libertarianism and objectivism are not the same thing. Libertarianism is an ambiguous political philosophy that basically constitutes a big tent of people who call themselves libertarians. Objectivism is a clear, distinct, highly specified philosophy for living. A philosophy that gives you guidance about how to live. A philosophy that gives you guidance on, on what is the appropriate way of achieving knowledge, of, of, of attaining knowledge a philosophy that has a position about the nature of reality and the nature of human consciousness. It, it, it is a thorough philosophy. It is not, and even its political ideology is clear. It's not a big tent. It's laissez-faire capitalism. It's complete freedom. It's the government, complete separation between state and economics. The government only protecting individual rights, nothing else. And individual rights being a thing a crucial political principle. Again, not clear libertarians agree with that. So no, objectivism and libertarianism are clearly different, distinct sets of ideas, if you can call libertarianism a set of ideas. Hiram, I mean, it is a set of ideas, but it's pretty broad, big tent. Hiram, uh, Yuan, do you think the ethno-religious names like Magen David Segol, Magen David Segol, a good for business. Um, I don't know what Magen David Segol is. I know what Magen David Adom is. Um, but I don't know what Magen David Segol is, and I don't know what the context is. Um, I don't like anything that's particularly in, in a, a, that, that's exclusive. 
that presents the image of exclusivity uh, on the basis of religion or ethnicity or race or anything like that. So, no, I, I, I don't think it's particularly good for business, but I don't know what the Segol means in this case, so you're going to have to enlighten me. Reason, purpose, self-esteem are the three values, cardinal values, not virtues. But reason, purpose, self-esteem, three cardinal values. Uh, shalev, it's not shalev, stav. Israel's view that man has a certain nature, not the same as biological determinism. What if I don't want to choose happiness as my standard? I'm still alive, and who is to say that's not appropriate? Um, so, you know, uh, man has a certain nature. That is a metaphysical fact, whether you like it or not. He has a certain nature. You, 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 we, know, we understand this in a biological sense, right? That if you drink poison, you die. If I stab you in the heart, you die. Nature, nature's dictating that. It's, it's, you could wish it away, it doesn't change it. So man has a certain nature. And that nature is of a biological entity. And then once you, if you don't choose happiness as your standard, you don't have to, you know, happiness is not your standard. Life is the standard. Life is what? Life is what? As a, as a dog, or beware, somebody might eat you. But as what? If you choose life as a man, if you accept the fact that you have a biological nature, then in order to live that life, you have to do certain things. It turns out that those certain things will lead to your happiness. You have to live by reason. Now, if you want to choose not to live by reason, you can. Absolutely, you can. But you won't live a good life. In a good society, you might even die. You know, life, happiness is not your standard, so you're not going to work. Fine, then you'll die. And in a good society, in a proper society, nobody will actually feed you. Like, charity... It's not available for people who choose not to work, choose eh, not to really pursue values, choose not to do anything. So if once you choose to live, once you choose to live, there's certain requirements, objective requirements. You could choose not to abide by those requirements, but then you're completely dependent on other people in order to sustain your life. And maybe you can find some suckers who will do that. Certainly in modern society, there are lots of those suckers, and the government f enables them. But you'll live a pathetic, awful life. And fine, live a pathetic, awful life. You certainly have a political right to do that. But morality is not about living a pathetic life. Morality is about living a life. We have a nature that leaves us free to choose our values. So we can choose to just drift, to not be happy. We can choose that. The re so the fact that we can choose that makes morality necessary because morality guides our choices with regard to living life, life as a human being, which means life as a conceptual being. That's Man is a rational animal, which means life to your fullest ability as a conceptual being. And morality gives you guidance on how to live that life. You might decide, I don't care. I don't want morality. Fine. You will suffer the consequence of that choice. And you'll live whatever life you want. So politically, I'm not going to force you to be an um, a, um, egoist. I'm going to force you to be rational. I'm going to force you to pursue reason, purpose, and self-esteem. You have to choose that. And be, but you can still choose not to do it and suffer the consequence of that. And in a good society, nobody feels obliged to help you out when you make really, really, really dumb choices. Choices that are anti-life. Why would they help you? I mean, one of the real evils about altruism is that we're forced to help people who don't deserve to be helped. And many people don't deserve to be helped. 
Michael, what if anything can the USA do to encourage assimilation? I think assimilation would seriously help the current immigration problem. So two things. First, there is no assimilation problem. All the data suggests, all the data suggests, that the current immigrants into the United States, legal and illegal, assimilating at about the same rate as they assimilated in the past. That is, when Irish immigrants came in, everybody worried about them assimilating because the culture was very British and the Brits and the Irish hate each other, and yet they assimilated. Uh, when the Polish came and the Eastern Europeans came, there was a huge worry. These barbaric Eastern Europeans are coming. They won't assimilate. They assimilated. And we know certain characteristics of what that assimilation looks like. How quickly do they learn the language? Uh, how quickly do their children, their ancestors, uh, rise in terms of income to the same level as Americans, right, as, as native-borns? Um, and you can go. There, there are a bunch of statistics that measure assimilation. And by pretty much all of those statistics, uh, Hispanic migrants over the last 40 years, 50 years, have been assimilating just as well as Poles and Irish and Jews and, and, and the Chinese assimilated into American society 100 years ago. Assimilation continues. So that's one. Uh, and the fact that they look different makes no difference. Indeed, Italians look very different than Swedes. And yet Italians migrated to the United States and Swedes migrated to the United States and nobody cares anymore because they all assimilated. And they all came to accept that you judge people as individuals not based on their looks and not based on their ethnic origin or their national origin. Um, but I agree that we could do a better job, much better job. What would a better job assimilation of assimilation policy be? Well, one, we should say without any shame, embarrassment, hesitation, American culture is phenomenal, great. And we expect you to assimilate to it. Same thing in the UK, same thing in Germany. Whatever the culture is, Western culture is a superior culture. You came here for a reason, because we're more successful than you were, where you start, where you came from. And you're going to study our culture. So the first thing you need for assimilation is to reject multiculturalism. You have to reject the belief that all cultures are equal. They're not. Some cultures suck. Most cultures suck. Some cultures are unbelievably horrible, primitive Disgusting. Ours is good. Embrace our culture. So we need to reject multiculturalism and be proud. Proud of the fact that we are, um, that we are, um, that our culture is better. And our culture is worthwhile. So we need to expect it. We need to um, start you know, we need to uh, emphasize that in our education. We need to emphasize the goodness of America without whitewashing the evils, that the basic goodness of America, the goodness of the principles on which it was based. And we need to treat people as individuals. We need to live up to those principles. So the best way to get people to assimilate is to stand up for our values and to recognize our virtues, and to demand that the immigrants embrace them. That's basically it. Not accommodate them, not bend to their demands, if they have any. Um, I think Bob says, it's arguable that black Americans still haven't assimilated. Yeah, I mean, the reason they haven't assimilated is because of racism. When you had Jim Crow laws for 100 years, how, how are you going to assimilate into a culture with Jim Crow laws going on? When you had redlining and institutional racism suddenly into the 60s, and to some extent later than that, much of that has been gone away. But yes, the, the, the responsibility of assimilating black Americans into black society is you have to get rid of the racism. And then 
you have to demand that you and they all start treating everybody as individuals. You have to embrace Martin Luther King's colorblind view. But you have to recognize that when blacks look around, particularly in the history, but even in today's world, they don't see people viewing them as colorblind. Everybody's always talking about black this, black that. I mean, Donald Trump saying, well, come on, lady, is she black? Is she black? She called herself black. I mean, who cares? Why is it relevant? Why are you even talking about it? Stop talking about it. I don't think looking different is a barrier. I think it's, it, yeah, it could slow things down, but uh, it shouldn't. Not if we took our ideology seriously, our idea seriously. <coughs> WCZN will super chat some updates when my time zone match to catch the show live. Ha <laughs> ha. Uh, great. So he says, we'll super chat some updates when my time zones match to catch some shows live. Sounds good. Looking forward to it. All right. Hero says, uh, purple is just a nice, fancy color to describe things. <laughs> okay. Uh, thanks, Hiram. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't like ethnically focused names of businesses. No. WCZN, thank you for the suggestion to travel. Hope the Iran's Rules book is in the works. It's not, actually. I'm, there's another book with Don on a different topic. Uh, videos were life-changing. I'm glad. I hope many of you who are new to the Iran Book Show go back and listen to the Rules for Life videos. They, they had a huge impact on a lot of people, and I think a lot of you could benefit from them. And, you know, particularly, what was it Bob Hill here who's new? Uh, people who are new to the channel and new to objectivism, new to what's going on. Read Ayn Rand. Definitely read Ayn Rand. Read Fountainhead, Atlas Shrugged, uh, Virtue of Selfishness, Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal, the, the, the main books by Ayn Rand. But, but then I think you can gain some value, uh, particularly if you're enjoying the show, from uh, reading the rules, from listening to the Rules for Life series. I've got a playlist on my channel with all the Rules for Life videos there that I think 20 or 21 uh, videos. And at some point when I, f when I don't feel like I'm constantly repeating myself, I will start them up again, right? I'll, I'll do them again. I'm sure if I do them again, I'll do them a little differently. Um, and uh, just because every time you cover a topic, you have it differently. But right now, it, it, you know, up until now, every time I've started to do something like, felt like I just talked video. So if you guys support that, <laughs> Maybe once a week I'll do a, a Rules for Life, or once every two weeks I'll do a Rules for Life video, if, if you guys support that. Um, Robbie says, uh, Yvonne, I went back and watched last year's Labor Day video. Great video. Thank you for your beautiful work. I appreciate it. Yeah, I, there's a lot of old videos, uh, thematic videos, not news videos, but thematic videos on particular topics that I think are timeless. And... Um, have great value, and, and those of you who are new to um, the channel should definitely go back and and um, listen to them, watch them. I think you'll enjoy them. Uh, Luca has a relevant question, so let me go to Luca. On multiculturalism, would you support a prohibition on women wearing hijab, chador, or burqa in modern Western societies? No, I, I wouldn't support a prohibition on it unless it was for some kind of security reason, right? Um, or unless, you know, if, if, if the woman who coerced doing it, but they would have to complain about it. So I, I don't see a basis on which to restrict people's dress. Uh, but I do, I do think, and, and, and this is the reality that I think we would face in a truly free society, employers would not hire people wearing burqas or chadors or hijabs. Say employers would be a... And you could even imagine a business saying, yeah, don't come in here with a hijab. We're not going to serve you. We're not interested. And, and I, think, I think that's the best way to apply these principles, not the government doing it. And, this is, and multiculturalism shouldn't be a government project. It's not that the government should... Stop embracing, I mean, the government should stop embracing multiculturalism because the government shouldn't embrace ideas. But it's not that the government should impose Western civilization. It's that the government should back off of, 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 of all this affirmative action 
and all this tolerance of uh, multicultural ideas. The government, should, but the government then should stick to protecting individual rights, and no individual rights are uh, violated by a woman wearing a hijab. But private individuals can do it. Private individuals should be allowed to discriminate. This is one of the things that a proper government would allow. And therefore, private individuals should tell people, you know, in our neighborhood, it's just not appropriate to be dressed like this. Just like if somebody dresses like a slut, I don't know, in, in, in some places, in some neighborhoods, people will say, you know, probably shouldn't dress like this to the, I don't know, the grocery store. To the, I, I, I don't think people do that enough. Uh, but there's something about social pressure, about, you know, people, and maybe it won't work in the first generation, they'll wear their burkas. Maybe in the second generation, the kids will go, you know, it's embarrassing, Mom. It's embarrassing to go to the grocery store and everybody looking at you like you're weird. I'm not going to wear that one of those. I think that's how you do it. You shame them. And I think shaming is a good thing. You, you embarrass them. You, again, you don't, not, not in a rude way, just it's inappropriate. Um, so I think social pressure, that's the way I would do it. I do not, I don't think social pressure is second-handed, no. Um, first of all, what she's doing is irrational. So the social pressure is, is moving it towards rationality. It's, but particularly when it comes to cultural issues, social pressure is saying, um, you know, maybe I'm in a different place now. Maybe their standards are different. Maybe I'm in a different culture. Maybe I should consider being, you know, maybe, maybe this culture is different. It opens the mind. So it's not force. Um, and considering other people's opinion is not second-handed. I consider other people's opinions all the time. I encourage people to tell me if they think I'm wrong because I can learn from that. So taking the opinions of other people into account is not second-handed. Adopting them blindly is second-handed. Adopting them because they're other people's opinions is second-handed, right? You adopt the idea because my neighbor believes it, then I'll believe it. But if my neighbor believes something and he's saying it to me and I think about it and I land up agreeing with him, that's not second-handed. So I, I'm not against cancel culture. <laughs> It, when you're canceling something that's appropriate. Now, again, I don't think you have to be rude about it. I don't think you have to be obnoxious about it. But expressing your opinion to somebody is completely appropriate. Particularly when it's so culturally opposite. I mean, mostly I feel sorry for these women who have to wear these things. And I think even just sentiments like that, I, I'm, I'm sorry you feel the necessity to cover yourself up. I'm sorry your husband forces you to do this. All right, Andrew. Thank you, Andrew. $50, really appreciate it. A PhD in religion has released a book against selfishness. What about me? She seems to accept happiness as an end, but we must remove self-interest to be happy. How would you argue that happiness must be an effect of the self? not its abdication. Well, I mean, it seems like um, it's kind of in the very question itself. Um, happiness is the end. Whose happiness? Well, mine, but, but if you don't have a self, why should you be happy? And if you don't believe in self-interest, in below, don't believe the self should benefit, why, why should you be happy? By what right would you be happy? The only way to justify happiness is by justifying self and by recognizing that it's an interest. Well, if happiness is in your interest, well, why aren't all the things that, 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 are, that lead to your happiness in your interest? So, and this is the problem that they think you're happy because of your social connections. You have, I mean, some of that is true. Social connections are important. But, and they have a superficial understanding of what happiness is. It's tranquility. It's, you know, it's the, it's the 
Havis, you know, Sam Havis's detachment. But that's not happiness. Happiness is a is a is a, is a state of mind that is is fully. So, I mean, there's a lot you can say. That you 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 know, uh, uh, well, how do you achieve happiness by pursuing certain virtues? Which virtues lead to happiness? Virtues that relate to self, because you can achieve happiness when your condition in life is better. Now, we could argue about what makes my condition in life better, what's, you know, career versus family versus other things. But the standard notice is what makes my condition better, my life better. It's all a, a, a debate about what is more selfish. They could say helping your family is more selfish than working hard. Okay, I mean, I'm, I'm willing to have that conversation because you've accepted the, the, the context, which is selfish. So, but people hold these mixtures and they don't really explain what happiness is. So it's, 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 it's not held rationally, right? Uh, Luke says, Peacock has a wonderful chapter on happiness in Opal. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a really valuable chapter on happiness it, and, and it's, it's, it grounds it in, in a way I don't think any other material really does. Robert, uh, racism, uh, regarding racism, some objectors don't get and even bristle at the idea that some people have it harder than others and deserve moral credit for overcoming obstacles. No, not handouts, not compensation, but admiration. Yeah, I, I agree with that completely. And I don't know which objectivists don't agree with. It's kind of silly. You know, some people have it harder. They, they've got circumstances that were more difficult. They deserve credit for overcoming those circumstances. Moral credit. Absolutely moral credit. So, yeah, I agree completely, Rob. Uh, Jennifer says, telling a black native person you can't succeed, here's some welfare, it doesn't help assimilation either. Absolutely. Absolutely. The whole welfare state is geared against assimilation. Assimilation of blacks, assimilation of immigrants, assimilation of anybody. All right. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. I uh, appreciate all the support. Uh, hope you enjoyed the show. I will see you all. I don't know when. That's the reality. Uh, probably not tomorrow. Um, for sure not tomorrow. For sure. Pretty much sure not Sunday. Uh, I don't know about Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. Uh, the next two weeks, I just don't know. Because I'm in Israel. I don't know where exactly I'm going to do the show from. I don't know what time is, a good, is going to work out, given my schedule in Israel. I don't know what the internet's going to be like. I don't know if I have a dad. You know, just, just logistics are complicated. And, and I have a lot of family commitments. You probably know family commitments are tough. I have a lot of family commitments. And um, yeah. So Cassandra says, thanks for the show you're on. Time to fly a plane and selfishly enjoy every minute of it. You fly planes? You're actually a pilot? That is really cool. Not that I want to be a pilot. I don't. But it's really cool that you fly airplanes. Or does it just mean you're flying in an airplane? She says, time to fly a plane. I'll take it for her word that she is piloting a plane. Good for Cassandra. Uh, Luca says, safe travels to Israel. You're on. Thanks, Luca. Um, I'm, 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 yeah, I think they'll be safe. Uh, and uh, thanks to all the super chatters. And again, I'll see you. I'm not committing to when I'll see you, but I'll, I'll, I'll see you next week. I'll do a show next week. I'm just not sure when. Bye, everybody. Talk soon.